Welcome back everyone. This is lecture 20 of CS229 and the main topic for today will be variational autoencoders. So variational autoencoders is uh, probably one of the um, uh, simplest uh, deep generative models. Uh, so deep generative models is a very hot topic in machine learning right now where we try to build generative models of our data using neural networks and variational autoencoders was one of the uh, one of the early early um, models which made good progress in this field and is also probably the model that you know one should uh, start studying first because it has the key components that are kind of necessary that are used in in more fancier models so uh, for all, for for studying variational autoencoders first we will look at you know simple autoencoders uh, autoencoders have a long history and um, we we'll, we'll look at you know uh, what what simple autoencoders are and then we'll kind of uh, switch gears back into expectation maximization and look at a very look at a few variants of expectation maximization because that that uh, kind of gives good motivation into uh, variational autoencoders we'll first study something called as mcmc expectation maximizer mcmcem where mcmc stands for uh, markov chain monte carlo and uh, we will also um, we will also have a quick look at variational inference, which is kind of like a counterpart to uh, Monte Carlo techniques. Um, and then we'll, we'll look at yet another uh, um, variant of EM called variational EM, and then switch gears into the variational autoencoder itself. So that's the uh, plan for today. And uh, so if, if, if uh, in terms of the overall course, if we are able to cover this today, then probably today will be kind of uh, the last uh, math intensive class. We'll have one more class on, on Friday we'll, where we'll be covering more um, general topics like, um, like um, 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 evaluation metrics and, and you know, general tips for uh, executing machine learning projects that will not be as uh, math heavy. Uh, so probably this is going to be the last math heavy class and next week we'll be just doing review of all the uh, t uh, topics that we have uh, done in the course. And also the review that we do next week will, you know, kind of uh, will be suggestive of the kind of topics that are important for your final exam. So we'll be stressing more on topics that are um, important for the final exam um, so that you can uh, focus on it. Yes, question? Is the final simulation or is it like the last new topics after third So uh, the final is cumulative. Uh, it is, it is uh, since we did not have a midterm, it's, you know, it's cumulative. It, it covers everything. Uh, so, a quick recap of uh, what we covered in the last class. So, in the last class, we mostly dealt with the uh, principle called the maximum entropy principle, where entropy of a probability distribution is defined as the, exp the expectation of the negative log of uh, the uh, probability value itself. And the maximum ent entropy principle suggests that we should uh, maximize the entropy of a probability distribution that we are trying to estimate subject to some constraints, where most of the times the constraints are expectation of some function of the, uh, of the variable or of the uh, space over which the distribution is defined. And we want the expectations to be equal to the empirical, uh, uh, you know, uh, empirical uh, expectations, and these generally come from data. Right, this is where data comes in into the uh, maximum entropy principle because they serve as the as the values to which we want the constraints to satisfy. Right, so subject to um, subject to these constraints, we get an entire family or an entire class of uh, probability distributions that satisfy this constraint. Right, so supposing these uh, uh, you know t1 and t2 are like um, you know uh, x and x square. So if t1 of x equals x, t2 of x equals x square, then basically the constraints that we are trying to express is the first moment of the data should be, you know, some, the uh, uh, first moment of the, of, the, uh, of the data, the second moment of the distribution should be the second moment of the data, and so on. And subject to these constraints, we basically have an infinite number of probability distributions in general, uh, because satisfying just two or three constraints is, is, uh, is pretty easy. And then the maximum entropy principle suggests that among the class of all these candidate probability distributions that satisfy these uh, moments, the one that we want to choose is the one that maximizes entropy. Okay. Yes, question? 
So moments are, you know, um, so expectation of x is called the first moment, expectation of x square is the second moment, expectation of x cube is the third moment and so on, right. So, um, the, 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 uh, the, the objective that we want to maximize is the uh, entropy. I think there was also a question somebody asked uh, where why are we trying to maximize entropy and why not maximize variance. Uh, maximizing variance for example will, uh, so, so supposing our probability distribution is defined on the range A to B, right, finite support. Now uh, if we want a distribution that has high uncertainty across, then we need the probability uh, uh, PDF to look like this, which, which, which uniformly assigns 1 over B minus A density to all the, uh, all the areas. Now, if you want to just maximize variance instead of maximizing entropy, then the distribution that we have will be something like this, A and B, where half the mass is here, half the mass is here. Right? So this maximizes variance, but it does not necessarily mean that you are maximizing uncertainty. Right? So maximizing variance does not is not something that we want to do if we want to just increase our uncertainty and, and, and um, kind of stay unbiased about our estimate of, of uh, what the probability distribution is. Right? So uh, maximum entropy principles uh, tells us that satisfy these constraints and among the, all the distribution that satisfy is choose the one that has the highest entropy. And we saw that this is equal to this kind of dual problem, where the dual problem is maximum likelihood, where we want to, uh, if we were to start from another direction where we want to perform maximum likelihood, and the, uh, the, the uh, probability distribution, if we assume, is part of the exponential family, where the sufficient statistics of the exponential family are basically the constraints that we want to satisfy then these two problems are equivalent. In other words, maximum entropy naturally gives rise to the exponential family, uh, 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 exponential family of probability distributions. Right? And then we kind of um, saw this, this somewhat related topic called calibration, which is you know, super important if you're building um, you know, real world uh, uh, predictive models, real world forecasting models. So calibration is this property where the predicted probabilities you know, match the observed frequencies, where when you, when you, when you say that some, some uh, outcome has a probability of, you know, say 80%, you know, let's say it's going to rain tomorrow uh, with probability 80%, then if you collect the set of all predictions where the prediction was 80%, then approximately 0.8 fraction of those uh, true outcomes, it actually should have rained, right? Not more, not less. It should have, the, the uh, fraction of uh, observed uh, outcomes should match the predicted probability. That's, that, then that, then that, uh, model is then said to be well calibrated against uh, against that distribution, and we also saw that uh, calibration and accuracy are kind of orthogonal. One does not necessarily imply the other. You can have you know well calibrated models that are you know that have very poor accuracy and vice versa. And uh, related to this um, uh, uh, concept of calibration, there is this concept called a proper scoring rule. So you can think of loss functions as being a proper scoring rule if they take uh, a forecast distribution and some actual outcome uh, that was observed and kind of uh, basically give a score to the forecaster based on what the actual outcome was, right? And you can think of it as a loss function where, you know, the smaller the score, the better the forecaster was, right? And a proper scoring rule is one that satisfies this property where given any two probability distributions, P and Q, you know, where if we assume Q is like the real world occurrence uh, or the real world uh, probability distribution, the true probability distributions, and if X's are being sampled from this you know, real world, and these um, uh, real world samples are used to, to score the, um, score the uh, uh, forecaster's probability distribution, where you know, these are the predictions, then only when the uh, only when the prediction is the true probability the loss will be the lowest for any other probability distribution being uh, predicted if the true events are sampled from q then the expected uh, expected score for the uh, other forecast will always be higher than the expected score for the uh, true function being uh, true distribution uh, uh, being forecasted 
right? So this is called a proper, uh, proper scoring rule. And if we build models that optimize for proper scoring rules, that is, if, if our loss function is penalizing our prediction p using some proper scoring rule f, the, you know, and, and subject to few other you know, uh, 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 constraints, it's easy to see that, uh, that, that uh, proper scoring rules encourages our model to predict probabilities that are forecasted. Because th we are minimized at, at uh, uh, we are minimized when the predicted probability equal to the real world uh, occurrence of data. Right? And uh, we saw the connection to maximum entropy of this proper scoring rule that if we satisfy, if we strive to maximize the entropy or use the uh, maximum entropy principle, then as a consequence, the loss function that we get is going to be the negative log p of x, and that's, that's, that comes directly from this. So you know, we are trying to maximize this. Instead, we, we can minimize negative log p of x. Right? So the negative log likelihood is just the loss function of the maximum likelihood objective. And we saw that if you know, f of p x equals uh, negative log p of x is a proper scoring rule, because you know, if we just plug minus log p of x here and uh, take it to the other side, or you know, bring that uh, 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 to the other side, we get that KL divergence is always greater than or equal to zero, which is um, um, you know, which is true. That we've also seen that in the homework. So essentially, the the uh, the big picture is that maximum entropy principle encourages us to make calibrated predictions. Right? That's that's the big story from from uh, last class. Any questions on this before we move on to today's topics? Okay, cool. So today uh, we'll switch gears and talk about uh, variational autoencoders. And the first, the first step in this journey will be to have a look at what autoencoders are in general. So to study autoencoders, we again uh, go back to neural networks, right? So in neural networks. So the, the only kind of neural networks that you've studied so far are those that can be used in a supervised setting, where we have some, we start with some input layer, or we started with some input layer, and then we had all these hidden layers, right, fully connected, right, fully connected layers, and we ended up with a single scalar y hat and we compared it against you know the ground truth y or the true label y and out of these two we constructed a loss right and this was a scalar and then we uh, minimized the loss that gave us a, a, a scalar valued function as a function of all the parameters and then we basically um, you know um, optimize the loss by performing gradient descent on our loss function and in order to calculate gradient descent with respect to all the parameters we will we use the uh, uh, multivariate calculus chain rule which was essentially the same as back propagation right that, that's that's uh, that's what we did in supervised learning setting instead uh, now what we're going to do is we are only given x's so our training set is now just a set of x's x1 through xn, there is no y, <coughs> and the goal with autoencoders, the goal with autoencoders is to learn a way in which we introduce something called as a bottleneck and reconstruct the original data. What I mean by that is we start with the original, uh, with the input layer being x, right? And this used to be d-dimensional, right? And it, this will still be d-dimensional, right? So this is the input layer, and then we we have a few fully connected layers, right? And we bring it down to some k-dimensional hidden layer. Let's call it z, right? And from this k-dimensional uh, hidden layer. We start where, where typically k is smaller than d. From here, we start um, increasing the, the dimensions of the hidden layers until we are back to a d-dimensional um, d-dimensional layer, and this layer we'll call it x hat, 
and our loss will now be to to minimize x hat minus x. Right? So we want the output of our network to be the input itself. This may sound trivial, you know, because you know all what the network has to do is to you know take the input and give the same thing as the output. But the the uh, challenge for the network is that it has to basically take this uh, data transformation through this bottleneck layer z which has dimension k which is much smaller than d right? what this what this uh, encourages the model to do is to learn some kind of a low dimensional representation of our high dimensional uh, input data and then starting with this low dimensional representation we we map it back into the high dimensional um, uh, high dimensional uh, data itself Right? And if the model is able to successfully minimize this loss you know, to a satisfactory level, then essentially the model has learned to compress data into some kind of, um, uh, some kind of a, a latent state or a, or a hidden state. Right? So here we typically call the parameters of the first half of the network, let's call these parameters as phi. So these are all the weights and biases of all the layers until you know, the hidden layer that we are uh, interested in. And let's call the weights and biases of all the layers starting from this uh, hidden layer z all the way until x hat, which is the reconstruction, to be, let's call it theta. Right? And so the loss is now essentially you know, sum over i equals 1 to n, where small n is the number of examples. We want to minimize the norm between x i minus let's give them names so this part of the network which takes us input x and outputs z let's call it the encoder right so it encodes data into some hidden representation z and we'll call the second half of the network that takes z as the input and outputs x hat as the uh, output we'll call that the decoder right and the encoder is parameterized by phi and the decoder is parameterized by theta right so now the loss is uh, x minus x hat minus so first we want to encode x i and the parameter here is phi and we want to take this you know this is essentially equal we can call this z i and then we want to uh, uh, take the zi and, and feed it as input to the decoder. Right? So feed this into the decoder. And this decoder is parameterized by theta. Right? And this, this, uh, the version that comes out of the decoder, that is the, the, the original x encoded through the encoder and decode that encoding back from the decoder. Now this whole thing is x hat i. So we want to minimize the norm between x i and x hat i, where the loss is a function of theta and phi. Right? So this objective is basically the, uh, the uh, uh, gives you what is called as the autoencoder. We call it an autoencoder because we want to encode something and decode it back to the same thing, right? which, which, which is where the, the word auto comes in. And the way we, we go about uh, training this is through back propagation. Right? Uh, this is going to be a scalar loss because it's the norm of a vector or the norm squared of a vector. So we are starting with you know, some kind of a scalar loss. So uh, you, can, you, can, you can think of this as you, know, you, you come to uh, an encoded state and decode it back into um, x hat and Decode it back into x hat, and we are provided a second copy of x itself. So this is d-dimensional. This is d-dimensional. So start from the input, encode it, decode it. You get x hat. Take the uh, take the uh, original uh, another copy of x, and using these two, construct the last to be x minus x hat square. Right? And this is a scalar loss. This will be in R. Right? And this gives us a loss function against which we can now perform back propagation 
and train all the model parameters phi and theta. These are basically the weights and biases in the first half and the second half of the network. Right? And the way you go about doing ba um, back propagation is exactly how we saw in the in the neural network lectures. Yes, question. Good question. So the, the 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 question is, you know, how is this different from PCA? Right? In PCA, we are doing something very similar. We start with a a, a d-dimensional data and project it uh, down into a, a low a k-dimensional uh, hidden representation. And then um, in in PCA, we the the objective there was the to minimize the the uh, distance between uh, between every point and its projection. Right. Uh, the, the, the main difference between PCA and an autoencoder is that in PCA, the transformation from X to Z is strictly linear. Right? Here, you can have multiple hidden layers which have multiple nonlinearities. So, yes, so, so technically, you, uh, you could perform uh, uh, PCA with this thing, um, except in PCA, you might also require this um, would you need the exact mapping should, should this be the inverse you can you can do something very similar to pca with this without nonlinearities yeah you can do you can. so this is not the same as pca because here you know things can be nonlinear the the reason why you would want to do the uh, do uh, to do this with data in real life uh, is because you want to you want to learn some kind of a uh, uh, a useful hidden representation that has some kind of a latent meaning, right? Um, and uh, we, we'll see with variational autoencoders of how this uh, Z representation is kind of, uh, you know, where where the the uh, hidden representation with variational autoencoders will will uh, end up having some kind of a meaning. We'll we'll, uh, we'll see later today, right? So this is this is uh, variational autoencoders, and think of this. You can uh, you know in a simplistic term think of this as dimensionality reduction or uh, you know, uh, a way in which you're just uh, learning some kind of um, a compact representation for your data. There are variations of autoencoders called denoising autoencoders, where in denoising autoencoders, um, you you learn how to denoise your data by training, uh, by feeding some kind of a noisy version of the input, and in the loss, so so in the you, you feed a noisy version of the input, but try to recover the original X. Right, and that gives you something called as the denoising autoencoder, where the the uh, where the network learns to denoise the training data, and you know hopefully it generalizes to denoising unseen data as well. Right, so that's that's uh, there are many variants to uh, the autoencoder. Right. Any questions on this? Uh, this is all we're going to talk about autoencoders, and we're going to switch to a different topic. Yes. Uh, is this whole model independent of the output label? So there are no labels here. So the, the 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 task here is to not predict a label, but the task here is to go through this bottleneck and reconstruct the original data itself. That's the task. So uh, like, uh, if I consider Z as the last layer of the bottle of the first encoded part, what will be the like, what will Z output? So Z. So so the question is, if if we consider Z to be the output of the first. Um, um, first uh, half of the network, what should Z output? And the answer is, whatever the network realizes is the optimum Z that helps it recover back X hat. Right? It, the, the, uh, we, are not, we, we, we are not providing any kind of supervision of what Z should be. All we are saying is, whatever Z comes out of the first half should be the Z that you feed into the second half that, that performs good reconstruction of X. Yes, another question? Yeah, so two questions. Should, are, are phi and theta related in any way? Like no, phi and theta are just two different parameters. They're not necessarily related. Like no, we, we don't assume phi and uh, theta to be inverses. OK, and in the end, is your goal going to be like somehow to detach the second half of it and use that as a compression? Yeah, so so the, the, the eventual goal is uh, uh, to to use only the first half on unseen data to get their you know hidden representations or their compact representations so you can you can you know chop your network at this point and use it as an encoder where you're getting some kind of a compressed uh, compressed representation yeah so 
Yeah, so, so uh, the question is, you know, what's the dimension of Z? What's the, you know, uh, how many layers do we have? Those are all, those are all hyperparameters that you want to, that you want to tune, where you can, you can train with, you know, your training data and see how well the reconstruction is happening on a test data. And, you know, you can kind of do your bias variance analysis there. This question. Right, so uh, a relation to factor analysis, let's take that offline. Uh, that's, that's kind of uh, uh, tangential to our, our, our topic right now, but you know, I'm happy to answer that uh, after the lecture. Right, so um, the, this is, this is uh, the autoencoder, and we'll come back to autoencoder in, in, in a few minutes. In the, in the meantime, uh, a few more related topics for, for our buildup. So next, uh, so this was autoencoders. Uh, to uh, MC, MC, EM, right? So um, a quick recall of EM. So in EM, we, we, um, we perform this iterative procedure of going through two steps, the E step and the M step, over and over again until we converge. Where the E step was for all i, where i is indexing your data elements, set q i of z be equal to p of z given x i under the current parameter theta. And then uh, to make this more clear, let's also give time indexes. So at the teeth iteration, we use theta t. Right? And in the m step, we perform theta t plus 1 to be equal to, I'm just going to write it for one example, uh, um, but you know, uh, it's basically just the uh, sum over uh, all examples, arg max theta of the elbow. I'm going to write out the elbow in, in, in full form. Sum over z, q, t of z times log p of x, z parameterized by theta over of z, All right? Uh, this, in fact, uh, I'm just writing it in terms of uh, one example. Oh, all right, let, let me just write it in terms of all the examples. Uh, so i equals 1 to n, you have xi, zi, right? And zi here. And um, in this, we can make a, a, a few comments. First of all, we assume that we, we could perform this posterior calculation, p of z given x. We could calculate this uh, somehow, right? This is kind of an implicit assumption in EM, that we can calculate this posterior distribution p of z given x, right? That may or may not hold true in practice, right? So that was, uh, that was kind of a, a big assumption that we kind of quietly swept it under the rug and assumed we could, you know, calculate the posterior distribution somehow. Now, the challenge uh, comes when you're considering, you know, complex models. For example, suppose, suppose our model is something like this, right? So z comes from some normal distribution with mean zero, and i k times k, right? Uh, a continuous uh, latent variable z. And let's say x given z is some kind of a, let's say neural network, right? Neural network with parameter theta that takes in as input z, right? So z is, see, z is, is sampled from some Gaussian distribution, and we feed that Gaussian distribution. So imagine the second half of this network, right? We feed that z into a neural network, and out will come our data, the data that we observe, right? In this kind of a setting where our model is 
is so complex that calculating p of z given x is pretty much you know uh, impossible there's no way we can you know take take some arbitrary neural network and calculate the posterior of z given x in in, in a closed form estimate right it need not be a neural network it could be any kind of you know some complex model some complex zi that's parameterized by theta right this could be hierarchical it could be you know any any kind of a complex model now the question is how do we uh, perform em in the setting to estimate our parameters theta right because we are no longer able to come up with a closed form estimate for p of z given uh, uh, z given x right and this is where um, we can make a few observations so first of all in em in the m step we are holding q fixed right we saw this uh, previously as well the only place where the variable that we are optimizing this theta the only place it shows up is over here right while we are performing this as argmax this is the only theta that we are adjusting to perform the argmax right everything else here are constants right and so we can write this as i think we mentioned uh, this uh, uh, earlier as well that we can all in em the m step can always be written as one to n sum over z q i t of z i log p of x i z i and rise by theta these two are always the same will always uh, are, are equivalent because log of a by b can be written as log a minus log b and log b is essentially a constant with respect to theta so we can just get rid of the denominator inside the log right and now you know if you, if you look at this in this form we kind of get another insight the insight is that even though we wanted to even though in the e step we say we want to calculate q the probability distribution of of uh, the posterior of z we don't really want to calculate the density values itself right the only way q gets used in the m step is to is to uh, is to, is to uh, construct this expectation right so this is i equals 1 to n expectation of z i coming from q i of t of log p x i z i theta right or max right. so even though q i appears in this in this uh, expression it is only used to take an exp expectation of this function right we don't really need to calculate the density by itself we are only interested in the density of of uh, density values of q only to uh, perform this expectation right and using this insight that the purpose of q is only to take the expectation we can instead what we can do is to approximate this arg max theta sum over i equals 1 to n and over here what we are going to do is to replace the expectation with the monte carlo estimate of the expectation and what that means is um, instead of integrating over uh, this function using the density of q instead we will take many many samples of z from q right and average take the average of this across all those samples of of z right so that would look like something like this um let's assume we take capital t number of samples for each example and this would be uh one over capital t t is probably a bad choice so let's call it capital m no so we we're going to use capital m number of samples for each monte carlo uh, expectation estimate 
uh, small m equals 1 through capital M log p of x i and z in place of z i, I am going to write z m, where z m is z m of i is sampled from q i of t. Right? So, we re rewrite this expectation as a Monte Carlo estimate where the z's are sampled from q's. The q's however is still this posterior, but there are many techniques to sample from a posterior of a complex probability distribution even though we don't know how to evaluate it. There are techniques uh, such as you know Gibbs sampling or uh, Metropolis Hastings. So, so uh, uh, MCMC is a vast, vast, vast field where there are many techniques uh, for sampling from posteriors even though we don't know how to exactly calculate the density of a given point in the posterior, but we can still get samples, right? And basically the law of large numbers tells us that as m goes to infinity, this Monte Carlo estimate will tend to, will converge towards the true expectation, right? And so um, with this technique, uh, you know, this is, this is a variant of EM where, you know, uh, even though we, do, we, we don't know how to calculate uh, uh, the posterior distribution, we can approximate the posterior using Monte Carlo techniques or sampling techniques, right? So this is, this is one way to, to uh, work around uh, complex uh, or, or hard to compute posteriors. Any questions on this? This question? The last step? Yeah, so in the last step what we are doing is we are replacing this expectation with the Monte Carlo estimate of the expectation. Right, so we, we replace this expectation with the Monte Carlo estimate of the expectation. Where did the Q go? Where did the Q go? Q is, is, is a distribution from which the ZIs are sampled. Right? So over here ZI was sampled from Q and this was an analytical expression for the expectation. Instead we replace it with a Monte Carlo estimate of this expectation where ZIs are sampled from Q and we sample capital M number of such uh, samples from uh, a QI and construct this average of this function for using those uh, samples as the Monte Carlo estimate of the expectation. Yes, if uh, as you take m to infinity, then these two will evaluate to the same value, right? And that's the law of large numbers, right? So, um, the original EM, we constructed a convergence proof where with every E and M step, the likelihood was only increasing, right? We, 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 we saw that uh, proof with you know, a likelihood, construct a lower bound and then construct a lower bound and another lower bound. And at every step, we were guaranteed that you know, the, 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 the theta t's were increasing the likelihood. But over here, that guarantee does not hold anymore. Right? Because this is an approximation and not uh, an approximation of the uh, uh, lower bound and not, and not the exact lower bound. This question? So with Gibbs sampling, you can sample the uh, posterior, samples from the posterior. So you, we get samples of z's, right? And using the sample values of z's, we can take the average of the of the joint. Good question, right? So this is this is one approach to uh, uh, to addressing intractable posteriors through this technique called sampling, right? And there is you there is this other kind of counterpart approach uh, for approximating uh, complex posteriors which is called variational inference. Right. So to, uh, when you want to calculate posterior distributions, you basically have three choices. Choice number one is the exact posterior, like, you know, use math, algebra, use Bayes rule and, 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 and calculate the exact posterior. If that is not possible, you're left with two other choices. 
Choice number two is to approximate it using GIP sampling or, or um, uh, through some kind of a, a sampling approach, a Monte Carlo approach, where you take samples and take the expectation of the thing you want to you want to uh, 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 take the expectation of with respect to the posterior. Option number three is variational inference. So variational inference is another technique to to uh, work around these uh, intractable posteriors. And in order to kind of um, understand variational inference, we go back to we go back to the expression we derived in EM, which was basically log p of x was greater than or equal to elbow of x with some q. Right? We derived this using Jensen's inequality. And we left it at this form, saying, you know, uh, the elbow is a lower bound of the uh, uh, of the uh, log probability of the evidence, right? It's the uh, lower bound of the evidence. But how much is it lower by, right? So the question is, log p of x is equal to elbow of x plus what? And in fact, the, the answer is pretty straightforward. All what you want to do is take this to the other side and you get this is equal to log p of x minus elbow, right? And the elbow is basically this form. And you plug in this form over here. I'm not going to do the, do the algebra. It's pretty straightforward, very simple algebra. What you get over here is basically the KL divergence between Q and P of Z given X. Right? And this should not be surprising because when Q is equal to P of Z given X, we saw that the elbow is tight and will be exactly equal to log P of X. Right? So it could have been the KL divergence from P to Q or Q to P. You know, one of those two were the natural choices. But if you work out the algebra, it turns out that it is, you know, uh, the KL divergence from Q to P, P of C given X, right? So our, our uh, goal is to estimate log P of Z given X, right? And here we are making this observation that, uh, you know, um, the KL divergence between Q and P of Z given X is equal to, you know, uh, th this value over here. So this is basically kind of uh, uh, the motivation for how we derive the variational inference. Uh, so for variational inference, what we see is uh, log p of x does not have any q term in it. Right? So this is effectively a constant. So log p of x is basically a constant. It has um, it has no no q term in it and then we and then we have the elbow of x q plus dkl of q to p of z given x right so this is a constant with respect to q respect to Q and this has a Q term and this has a Q term and we want our Q to be exactly equal to P of Z given X right and or um, um, that that is that's our eventual goal or the the ideal goal that Z is equal to P of Z given X but instead with a variational inference what we what we do is we in order to make it as close to P of Z given X as possible, we maximize this with respect to Q. Now, if we maximize this with respect to Q, make this observation that this is greater than or equal to zero. So for no value of Q, will this become negative? Right? No matter what Q we choose, uh, will that become negative? If we choose the best possible Q, then this just this term just becomes um, um, zero. So 
instead of uh, calculating p of z given x uh, somehow, we take this variational approach where we say q of z given or q of or rather p of z given x next be approximated by the arc max of q in some family q of the elbow of x comma q If we maximize the elbow as much as possible with respect to q, we are bounded by log p of x anyways. Right? So this provides like a ceiling. And if we maximize the elbow as much as possible, because this is non-negative, the highest possible we can take this, when we maximize this completely with respect to q, we would have naturally obtained a q that minimized the KL divergence between q and p, given, p of z given x. Does that make sense? Right? So performing arg max of this elbow over q will give us a q that is very close to p of z given x. And this kind of an approach where we maximize this lower bound with respect to q and obtain a distribution which we approximated to be p of z, z given x is called variational inference. And this is, you know, uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, complementary approach to the sampling-based approaches. Because in sampling-based approaches, you could take an infinite number of, exam of, of of samples, and eventually you would get the you would recover the exact uh, uh, um, evidence lower bound. You would recover the exact elbow as you took m to infinity. Right? Whereas over here. Most of the times, we will not recover the exact posterior, but we will end up having some kind of an approximation of p of z given x, depending on how flexible this family of q is. Right? And over here, the technique we used for sampling, whereas with variational inference, that the technique we use is optimization. Right? In sampling, we do, you know, sampling in Monte Carlo techniques, we do sampling. With variational inference, we do optimization. Here, in the limit, we recover the exact solution, whereas over here, we always get an approximate solution depending on, you know, how flexible the, the family Q is. Over here, if you're familiar with Monte Carlo techniques, you never know how good your estimate is. You know, you need to keep taking more and more samples. All you know is eventually, you will reach um, uh, the exact solution. But at any given time, say you, you've taken you know, 100 samples, you've taken 10 million samples, that you don't know how good or how close you are to the true expectation. Right? You're just told that eventually you will be. But this technique will converge. Right? You know when to stop. When this, when this maximization, you know, um, 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 when, when, when you complete this optimization problem, you know that you know, you know when to stop. You know that the solution is approximate, but you know when to stop. Whereas over here, you don't know when to stop. Right? So those are like you know, the, 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 the trade-offs between, between uh, Monte Carlo techniques and variational inference techniques, or the sampling techniques versus variational te inference techniques. Yes, this question. Yeah, so so the you know the Q that you end up here, you're going to plug it in over here. This is the first part and that's the second. Yeah, you can think of this as the first part where you recover a Q using variational inference and use that Q to construct your uh, M step objective, okay. right? And um, uh, um, whereas over here uh, you constructed the M step uh, uh, objective or the proxy to the M step objective through sampling, whereas here. You know the proxy was through this uh, approximation of uh, uh, from from the variational inference step, right? And this technique of constructing the M step ob objective using a proxy Q instead of the exact posterior Q, 
will give rise to something that is called variational EM. In both MCMC EM and variational EM, the, the goal is to work around the construction of the exact posterior. Right? In MCMC EM, we worked around it using sampling, Monte Carlo sampling or Gibbs, uh, Gibbs sampling. In variational EM, we worked around the exact posterior using variational inference. This question? So, so uh, I guess the question is, you know, uh, 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 suggesting a technique of how we can check whether MCMC has converged. Uh, uh, I'll not go deep into. I'll not go uh, deeper into that. We can we can discuss that offline. But uh, in general, it's a hard problem when you're running Monte Carlo techniques to know, you know, um, whether you you kind of. Um, uh, so, so the the uh, technical term there is something called as a burn-in phase, where First, uh, you know, you start with some kind of an initialization, and you don't know how good it is. So you want to, you know, first discard some samples, and then hopefully after the burn-in phase, where the, which is hard to calculate whether the burn-in phase is over or not. Hopefully from then you're getting, you know, samples from the true posterior, and then it becomes a question of how many you want. But in general, calculating whether the burn-in phase is over or not is is kind of a a, a, a hard problem. All right. So the two so uh, in in the, in the standard EM. You calculate the exact posterior using, you know, math and you know analytical expressions. If that is hard, you, you you're left with two options. One option is MCMC EM, where you approximate the M step with uh, you approximate the M step with uh, 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 the, the expectation in the M step with the uh, Monte Carlo expectation. And in variational uh, EM, which is the other approach, you know, uh, you can you construct an approximation of Q from some family capital Q, and you use that the the um, the recovered Q from optimization and construct you know the uh, the M step uh, proxy by using the Q that came from the variational step. Yes, question. Why is this called MC, uh, MCMC? Uh, Monte Carlo uh, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. That's the you know the techniques you use are called MCMC techniques. To obtain samples, right? Right. So now, um, a few more details about uh, variational inference, and then we can we can start talking about the variational autoencoder. So, in, in variational inference, most of the time the question is, how do we choose the family Q from which we want to perform optimization? And a common uh, family of of, uh, of probability distributions is to so remember z so the q distribution that we are uh, trying to recover in variational inference is over z's and z is a vector in R k right it's a k dimensional vector so our probability distribution must be a distribution over k vectors or, or uh, vectors of dimension k right and high dimensional uh, uh, probability distributions are quite few you don't have as many probability distributions as um, distributions over scalar values and a common assumption made in variational inference is to assume that Q of Z are the, the uh, family of distributions from which you want to perform the uh, uh, optimization. Q of Z, where Z is in, you know, think of it as an RK, can be factored into components Q1 of Z1 times Q2 of Z2 times QK of ZK, right? We're going to assume, if we assume that the components of the uh, of, of the Z vector can be factored into independent scalar probability distributions. So, if we make this assumption, which is a common assumption that is made, then 
there is a name given to uh, given to this assumption. It is called mean field assumption. Mean field assumption and variational inference that uses this kind of a factorize uh, this kind of a factorization is called mean field variational inference. Right? And um, the roots into why we make this assumption is is beyond beyond the scope. Uh, for those who are interested, uh, okay. So the obvious first, uh, you know, the most simple reason is that it makes computation easier, right? You're 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 uh, making strong independence assumptions, but you know you get uh, computational ease in return. And there are other, uh, uh, you know, good reasons why this uh, this can be done in certain cases. For example, so so the mean field variational inference actually comes from statistical physics, where you know variational inference was kind of uh, uh, I guess it was invented in, in, in statistical physics where you make this uh, mean field assumption and that kind of holds well in statistical physics for uh, whatever reasons. But you know, it may or may not hold on your data, uh, but you know, it's still commonly done because it makes computation easy. And in fact, the word mean field uh, uh, comes from statistical physics where you know, um, from, from you know, field theory and whatnot in statistical physics where they make these approximations that uh, things are th things are independent. However, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to call all the techniques that make this assumption as mean field techniques, where uh, the Q that we are trying to the family Q where we are trying to perform the maximization can be factored into these uh, individual components. Okay. And this mean field technique, a uh, mean field uh, assumption. Is something that we're going to use in variational autoencoders. Right? So we uh, this this is just a name. Variational autoencoders. So if you remember in EM, in EM. We, we constructed this elbow, right? And the elbow had a Q and parameter theta, right? In the E step, we would find the best possible Q, which is the uh, posterior, and in the M step, um, we would we would update theta uh, in the uh, to recover uh, the next uh, the next uh, estimate of theta, and while performing each of these steps. In the E step, while we were calculating the next Q, we would hold theta fixed. And in the M step, when we were calculating the next theta, we would hold Q fixed. Right? And that is a technique that's also called coordinate ascent. Right? In coordinate ascent or coordinate descent, our objective has multiple variables. And the way we go about optimizing it is to start with some initialization, hold most of them fixed, or all except one fixed, or all except you know a subset fixed. And while holding them fixed, optimize the ones that we have not held fixed. And once you obtain their updated estimate, then hold the updated estimates fixed and you know optimize the uh, other ones and so on. So one way to think of it is, you know, if this is um, Q and, and 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 theta, and supposing this is the contour plot of elbow of the elbow, right? we start with some. Let's say we start with some point over here, right? And we opt, we hold Q fixed and optimize it with respect to theta, and we reach some point over here, and then we hold theta fixed and optimize it with respect to q and we need some point here and then we hold q fixed and optimize it with respect to theta and then hold theta fixed optimize it with respect to q and so on uh, where we are we are uh, updating only one of the axes at a time and this is called uh, basically a uh, uh, coordinate ascent where we are trying to kind of climb this hill 
of this contour plot of the uh, of the elbow by moving in only one direction at a time. So we are either moving north south or moving east west, right? And and uh, keep moving until we have kind of reached the local optima along that direction, and stop there, and then start moving you know north south until you reach a local optima, and then again east west until you reach a local optima, and so on. So that's coordinate ascent. And in this coordinate ascent kind of worked well with, um, with, with classical EM, where the optimization along the Q step was not gradient ascent, but we were just calculating the posterior. Right? So calculating the posterior, so starting from this and just calculating the new Q, which is the posterior corresponding to this value of theta, was the E step. Right? So, so the E step moves this way. And the M step moves this way. Right? Now, using this kind of uh, coordinate uh, uh, ascent, you know, if we ask the question, can we do gradient ascent instead? You know, what does that even mean? Right? Instead of doing coordinate ascent, can we do gradient ascent? And and that basically um, gives rise to the variational autoencoder. So in the variational autoencoder, we are going to uh, maximize the elbow using gradient ascent. And the way we go about doing it, we're going to first assume that the distribution from our, our the model is something like this. So we're going to assume z comes from some normal distribution k times k. Okay, so that's uh, that's that's uh, where z comes from, and then z comes from that, and x given z comes from some normal distribution whose mean is given by a function g of z parameterized by theta and we're going to assume some kind of a fixed fixed variance okay. so z z is the is is like the um, latent variable so z is sampled from some um, um, some some uh, normal distribution this is the prior and x given z think of this as the likelihood And now, in order to in order to uh, perform the the um, e step, we need to get the posterior. Right. So the posterior is you know, if we have access to it, it would be p of z given x. Right. But 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 if it, with this kind of uh, um, a model. Where G is a you know, neural network with parameter theta, it's very hard to to calculate p of z given x. You're probably never going to be able to obtain a p of z given x uh, in a, in a close form estimate. So when we don't have a, an exact solution, basically we have two other options: sampling or variational inference. Right? And the the techniques that's used in the variational autoencoder is you know not surpri surprisingly variational inference. Right, which is why we call it the variational autoencoder. So we want to estimate or approximate p of z given x using variational inference. And the way we go about doing variational inference is that the family Q, Q family for variational inference, right? we need to choose a family for uh, doing variational inference. And that family is basically qi is equal to normal distribution with mean small q xi comma phi and a diagonal of v of xi 
What does this mean? Right? So first we spoke about having families of distributions uh, for, for performing variational inference. But in the, 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 the distribution or the uh, family of distributions uh, on which we perform variational inference, we would get a different Q distribution per example. Right? In, in, um, in, in, in EM, the E step is performed separately for each example. However, here what we are doing is we are recognizing the fact that QI depends on X, you know, because QI is supposed to be P of Z given X, and we are going to approximate the Q distribution across all examples using a neural network. Right? So the neural network will take X as the input and output the mean and variance of a normal distribution for the corresponding example qi, for the corresponding example i. And this is uh, sometimes called amortized inference. Right? Because uh, the, the, uh, the difference between em and uh, the, uh, the variational autoencoder here is that in em, we were separately calculating the parameters of the Q distribution for each example separately and independently, right? We would calculate Q, uh, 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 just going to uh, pull this here to, to right? In EM, we would loop over each example and for each example separately, we would calculate P of Z given XI, right? And once you calculate that, you know, keep it aside, pick the next example and repeat this and calculate the Q distribution for that example, right? And we would do that independently for each example. Whereas with, with amortized inference, what we instead do is, we're not going to calculate a separate uh, posterior distribution for each example. Instead, what we're going to do is, we're going to, we're going to assume that all Qs come from a normal fam, of, uh, belong to a normal distribution. And each of these, um, the mean and variance of each QI is going to be a function of your X's. Right? They're going to be a function of your X's. The mean and variance of each QI is going to be a function of the X's. And those functions are essentially neural networks. Right? So feed X as the input. And the neural network will output two scalars per input. One scalar is the, or, or one vector will be uh, the mean, the other vector will be the variance. So your Q network would look something like this. You know, take X as the input, right? And you will have a few layers, right? And as the final layer, you will get mu, right? So the mean, and we call this Q, right? Parameterized by phi. So phi, uh, Q phi, this entire network, right? This is Q parameterized by phi. So phi represents all the weights and biases of this network. So the input to this network is an example Xi. And the output of this network is some vector mu i xi was in rd, mu i is in rk, and this mu i will be used as the mean of a normal distribution, where this normal distribution represents qi. Yes, question? Why do you need a bottleneck? So there's no bottleneck here. We are just mapping it from x to mu. Right? There's no bottleneck here. They, these could be uh, any dimensions, right? We just need to go from X to Z. Uh, this is not an autoencoder yet. It's just some network that takes you from X to Z's. There is no bottleneck here. Uh, this question? Uh, yeah, K is generally less than D. Yes, that's the uh, general assumption because uh, in general, your latent, latent, uh, the latent representations will always have a compact representation. So Z's will be of dimension uh, K, K by K. And X's 
and and this will be in rd Yes. So why does it need to be a lower limit? So Q is a distribution over Z. So the question is, uh, why is mu a smaller dimension? That's because Q is a distribution over Z. And Z is k-dimensional. So the mean has to be k-dimensional. Right? So this should be in RK. The mean should be in, uh, 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 in RK because Z is in RK. Right? And the, the covariance should be in R of k times k. Right? This question? The, so the formula that you wrote where you're still referring to the various encoders, you just the So the, the thing we discussed in the beginning was, was just autoencoders all the way at the beginning. Okay. That was not variational autoencoders. So this is the model. So why is this justified? This is the this is the model we are starting with. You know, we are not proving anything. We are we are assuming if this is the model, and and and, and seeing what the consequences are. So that Z is not the compressed version, not the hidden different version of it. Yeah. So uh, uh, you know, uh, I would say you know, hold off making connections to autoencoders for a moment. We'll put them all together and see the connections soon. Right. So for now, Z is some hidden layer. You're right. Eventually, this will be like the the bottleneck layer. But for now. Uh, so assume, you know, just like in factor analysis. In factor analysis, z was some k, you know, k-dimensional uh, uh, vector, and x given z was, was was something else. So in place of that, assume you have a model like this. Right. So we go from from x, which is an R D, down to R K, and that will be the mean. Right. Yes, question. I don't understand um, how you got to the covariance. I'm going to come to the covariance now. Okay. So that gave us the mean. For the covariance, instead what we are going to do is have something very similar. Instead of Q, we are going to call it V. Right? So again, we are starting with X in RD and have some kind of a network. And, and over here, you're going to get uh, V again in R K, right? And this V, we are then going to make it positive because standard deviations and variances are always positive. And there are many techniques you can use to take any number and make it positive. One approach is to just square them. Another approach is to exponentiate each element. And both are, both are commonly done. So this V is, is generally taken to be, uh, let's call the last layer as, you know, I don't know, U, not me, U, right? Generally, the last layer of the, uh, of the variance network is taken to be you know, E to the U element-wise, right? to get positive standard deviations. Right? And this, um, this vector of length K, is then converted into a diagonal matrix where we have v1, v2, and vk. And this will be k by k. And this matrix is used as the covariance matrix of qi. Why we have two different models there. Um, Two different networks uh, to to take us from x to one parameter and x to another parameter. In practice, what's commonly done is to have a single network where everything until the last layer is shared, and at the last layer you have a separate branch. So one branch for the mean, one branch for the for the variance. Because we need two parameters for 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 a normal distribution, we need a mu and we need a covariance. And and you can you can you can get all of them as the output from the last layer. That's 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 also totally fine. That there's not much difference between having you know distinct networks 
versus having one network where you kind of split the last layer into different parameters. Both both work totally fine. So the, so the variance of its, yeah. yeah so so uh, essentially, QI. So the question is, you know, why do we? I guess, you know, why do we have two networks? I guess that's at, at the heart of the question. So the 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 QI we define it to be a normal distribution, and to, in order to define a normal distribution, you need two parameters, right? So for each example, we need two parameters: a mean and a variance. For another example, another mean and a variance. And because they are in high dimensional space, the mean and variance will be a vector and a matrix. Right? For another, uh, for uh, take a new example, you need a new mean vector and a new covariance matrix. Right? E the, the mean uh, uh, covariance pair is per example. And the way, instead of separately estimating them for each example, we are going to perform amortized inference, which means recognizing the fact that they depend on x. We try to capture the relation using a shared network where you feed in x and the output is the mean vector. Feed in x and the output is a covariance matrix. Instead of calculating them separately, this technique is called amortized inference. Right? And instead of estimating all the all the means and uh, all the means and uh, variances separately, we instead Learn the parameters phi and psi. Yes, question? So actually, as you mentioned, in, in the case of the Q, you use a parameterized by the feeding. Yes. And in the case of the B, you have parameterized by the psi. Yeah. How can you use the medical scale? Yeah, so the question is here we use the notation that phi is parameterized, uh, Q is parameterized by phi. And here it's uh, parameterized by psi. Uh, and I also mentioned that you can share all the layers uh, and, and have just uh, you know the, the last layer separate. If we do the shared layer, then this notation does not work. Right? So uh, the, uh, the, the, according to this notation, we, we just have two different networks. Right? And these parameters are psi, and these parameters are phi. Uh, but you can, you can you know, in practice, what's commonly done is you don't have two completely separate networks, right? They got, these two will have shared parameters. Next question. So you, you kind of just uh, assuming that like you kind of made completely made up like Q and uh, V, and you said that you get the mean and variance from them. And but how are you even going to verify like what those two networks put out is like reasonable? We'll come to that. We'll come to that. We're going to come to that. Right. And so the the um, we're going to have these two networks, which you know when you start they are untrained, randomly initialized. Um, you feed in an X, whatever you what comes out of uh, at the other end, you use it as the mean of the Q distribution for the E step, right? And you have this other network feed in. You get a vector, convert it into a diagonal matrix. And use it as the as the covariance matrix for the E step of that example. So for each example, you feed it once through this and once through this. Take the two parameters and plug it and construct the the E step of that example, right? And now, uh, because we are assuming a Gaussian distribution, and because we are having a diagonal covariance matrix, so Gaussian distributions have this property that uncorrelated, uh, that if there is no correlation between two components of a joint uh, uh, Gaussian, then they necessarily must be independent. Right? The Gaussian distribution is probably the only one, maybe there are others, but, but I think it's only the Gaussians that have this property that if you take a joint uh, Gaussian, uh, um, Gaussian vector and two components of the, uh, of the, of the joint have, are uncorrelated, have zero co covariance, then the two are necessarily independent. So this diagonal covariance matrix means we are using, we are making the mean field assumption. So because we have a 
we are we are uh, uh, constructing a diagonal matrix from a vector we are and we are using a normal distribution we are effectively doing mean field variational inference where we are assuming that each of the zi's are independent so this is the mean of the zi's and this is the these are the variances uh, of the zi's this question Yeah, so you can think. Uh, uh, I I I would say don't worry too much about this uh, 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 squaring because the what you get out of here is generally the uh, 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 is the standard deviation and the variance is basically the square of the standard deviation. That's why I use the notation here. You know, just the way in you know we write you know mean and sigma square. But, but it is element uh, because it's a diagonal element a diagonal matrix. You can think of it as element wise. Yes. This question. Uh, uh, can you please repeat the question? Variance instead of standard deviation. Yeah, you could you could you you know you can treat this as the variance. You can treat this as a standard deviation. That it's it doesn't make a lot of difference. You can you both both approaches work fine. This question. Yes, the, fee, the good point. So fees and psi's are shared across examples, right? You feed different examples through this network. The network is the same. The network stays fixed for all examples. The output of the network will be the mean and variance of the Q distribution. Good point, right? So, um, so now we basically have all the all the missing pieces, all, or all the pieces to write out our objective. And there's going to be one final trick that is required to finish this up. So remember, we first observed that EM was coordinate ascent. And now instead, we want to do gradient ascent. And the Q's here are coming through this amortized inference where we have a single network that outputs the parameters for each example rather than having different, uh, different uh, uh, parameters for each example. In standard EM, we calculate different parameters for each example in the E step. But with amortized inference, we just have one network having shared weights that outputs outputs the uh, Q parameters for all examples, right? So now, the elbow, we can write the elbow like this. So, so the elbow here will be over phi psi theta is equal to sum over i equals one to n expectation of zi coming from qi log p of xi zi parameterized by theta over qi of zi okay. where qi is a normal distribution with mean q x i parameterized by phi and covariance being a diagonal matrix to v network which takes input x i parameter psi right so this is our elbow now the original elbow so for reference, the e elbow with you know standard EM was over there. The elbow had just Q and theta, and that was sum over i equals one to n. So let me just write as as expectation. zi from qi log p of x comma z 
parameterized by theta and q i of z i. So this was the um, um, elbow in case of E m where each q was separately calculated for each example as a, in parallel. However, when we move over to amortized inference, we don't have q and, uh, uh, and, and uh, theta anymore. We had q because we, we would calculate q separately for each distribution. Instead of having separate q's for each uh, distribution, we instead have shared phi and psi that are shared across examples, right? And the, the, uh, the rest of the expression stays the same, except qi is now not something that was independently calculated for each example, but instead we use this amortized inference technique where we feed each example to these networks and the output of the network will become the parameters of the corresponding uh, Q distribution, right? So now we are pretty much, pretty much ready. Uh, in case of EM, we would optimize this elbow with coordinate ascent. Now we're going to optimize this objective with gradient ascent, right? And the parameters that we want to optimize are the phi, psi, and theta. So this means we want to now maximize um, this elbow with respect to um, uh, these parameters, which means we want our update rules to look like this. So we want theta to be theta plus some learning rate, let's call it uh, theta, you know, this is just the learning rate, times the gradient with respect to theta of elbow of psi phi theta and phi is equal to phi plus theta gradient with respect to phi of basically the same thing. Similarly, psi equal to psi plus eta times the gradient with respect to psi of the elbow. Okay. We want to do this until convergence, right? In EM, we would do E step and M, M step until convergence. In case of the variational autoencoder, we want to perform these gradient updates until convergence, which means in case of EM, we had Qs and thetas. Now we will have um, so thetas, and here we will have um, phi and psi. I'm just writing them together, and you have some kind of thing. You start with you know some random location, and we want to perform gradient update. Right? And most commonly, we don't do gradient ascent, we do stochastic gradient ascent. Um, and now the challenge is, how do we calculate these, uh, these gradients? Right? And once we are able to calculate these gradients, we are, we are effectively done. So the way we go about calculating these gradients is, so the first thing, the gradient with respect to theta. So gradient with respect to theta of elbow of phi psi theta is equal to gradient with respect to theta of i equals 1 to n, expectation of z with respect to qi of log p of x z parameterized by theta over qi of Z i. Now, how do we take the expectation, uh, 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 the gradient of you know, some term under an expectation? We just take the gradient inside the expectation, and we can take the gradient inside the expectation because the distribution with which we are taking the expectation does not depend on theta. Right? So this is equal to so more i equals 1 to n expectation z i from q i of the gradient with respect to theta of log log p of x i z i 
psi z i theta and the denominator will will just cancel just like in the case of em in case of em when we were optimizing with respect to theta the denominator could be removed right and this we will factor it out into p of x uh, p of x comma z is basically p of x given z times p of z right and this is equal to i equal to 1 to n with expectation z i from q i gradient with respect to theta log p of x i given z i parameterized by theta plus gradient with respect to theta log p of z i right and this just goes to 0 and this p of x given z if you remember p of x given z is our encoder right so p of x given z we assume uh, uh, takes this uh, this encoder and this is basically the this is basically the log likelihood using you know g the encoder right and we use gray, uh, the uh, back propagation over here now the challenge comes you know this was pretty straightforward we could just take the gradient inside the expectation and everything else uh, inside was pretty uh, simple and straightforward but now comes the challenge for the other parameters and this is where the the uh, the VAE's innovation uh, comes in so now if you want to do with respect to gradient with respect to phi elbow of phi psi theta equal to gradient with respect to phi some i equals 1 to n expectation of z i from q i of log p of x comma z theta and q of z i but now the q Q is basically what we saw is parameterized by phi and psi. And now if you want to take the gradient of this objective with respect to phi, then the distribution with respect to which we are taking the expectation depends on phi. Right? In these cases, we can't just swap the gradient and expectation. Right? And this is where really the, the, the kind of key innovation of the variational auto encoder comes into picture, which is called the reparameterization trick. Right? So the reparameterization trick is something we've seen already in the past, which is basically uh, if z if z comes from some normal distribution of mean mu and standard deviation psi, we can rewrite z to be equal to some epsilon times standard deviation plus mu, where epsilon comes from a normal distribution a standard normal distribution mm. right we're going to we're going to make use of this special property of gaussian distributions this is also called the location scale property where you can decouple a gaussian random variable from its parameters where the randomness is completely contained in the separate variable called uh, epsilon which has mean 0 standard deviation 1 and we can take these parameters and scale the standard uh, 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 standard normal and move its location to mu right and now we're going to rewrite this objective as the gradient with respect to phi sum of i equals 1 to n question. yes question The distribution qi is parameterized by phi precisely because qi mean depends on phi. Yeah. 
and this we are going to now rewrite it as i equals 1 to n expectation of epsilon coming from some normal 0 1. Right? So, we, instead of taking expectation with respect to z, we instead take the expectation with respect to epsilon which has no parameters and we are going to write log of p of x comma in place of z we take epsilon and the and the and the uh, uh, epsilon times the variance the standard deviation plus the mean so that will look this might look a little complex but for the uh, uh, let, let me use some simpler notation here so this we will write it as epsilon i times, I'm going to write it as psi i plus mu i parameterized by theta divided by q of epsilon i times plus mu i where mu i is equal to q of x i phi and i is diagonal of v of x i parameters by right and once we are able to rewrite the expectation with respect to z in terms of expectation with respect to some epsilon right and in place of z we are going to take epsilon and scale it by you know the uh, covariance matrix and add the mean vector that comes from q and v which is basically z. So, this whole thing over here over here is z i and similarly this whole thing over here is also z i where we make use of this this property to do these replacements and now the expectation does not depend does not have this parameter anymore and this will now allow us to swap it and again once we swap it the gradients can be taken in a straightforward way this question So, so, yeah, uh, so, so the question is why isn't our, you know, where is the loss for the correct mu, I guess. Yes, uh, yeah, so uh, let, let's piece it all together. That, that hopefully will answer it, right. So, this gives us a way in which we can take the, the gradient of the elbow with respect to phi, right. Taking the gradient of the elbow with respect to theta was pretty straightforward because we could swap the gradient and expectation because the expectation did not depend on theta in any ways. But for the other parameters where the, the expectation depends on phi itself, we make use of this reparameterization trick where in the, with the reparameterization trick we can rewrite the expectation from in terms of z to in terms of epsilon that has no parameters. This question. Yes, I am going to come to that. Right? So, now we have uh, replaced uh, 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 the expectation uh, with respect to z with respect with uh, expectation with respect to epsilon, right. So, the question is now, you know, piecing this all together, over here, uh, what we see, what, what, what we can see is, um, we still have, even though we were able to swap the gradient and the uh, expectation, we are still left with the expectations, right. So, the, so the gradients still have an expectation term left in it, right, which in general can be a, 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 a problem, but what is done in practice is that this expectation is approximated with Monte Carlo which means we take a sample z i from q i and construct and calculate the 
the um, um, and use that as the uh, uh, input for this encoder neural network to perform back propagation. And back propagation is performed with respect to theta. And the output of the neural network is trained to be excise. Right? If you, so this is the, the you, you can think of this as the as the uh, sorry this should be the decoder. I'm sorry about that. This is the p of c given x. So this should be the decoder. Where in the decoder you have fed the input uh, z i and the output should be x i. And we the the uh, x i the uh, x i over here let, um, instead of g let's give it a different name. Let's. Uh, What is the notes use for G? So, all right. So the note uses G for decoder. So, okay. So G is fine. Um, so this is this has uh, uh, the loss function over here is the maximum likelihood objective, and the maximum likelihood objective is just the multivariate Gaussian, and that gives us the loss, right? And this is basically you know the gradient of the loss of this multivariate uh, uh, Gaussian whose parameters are theta, uh, uh, whose parameters are the, um, so, so let me just uh, write this clearly. So you can think of this as a neural network where the inputs are z's, right? And the output is you know, x hat. And this x hat will, is, is uh, going to be uh, compared against x's, right? And the uh, so this becomes like the mean of the distribution, and x is going to be the observation. And we assume that the variance is some sigma square i, and this you plug it in into the you know log probability of x i parameterized by the mu that comes out of uh, g of z i and the variance is sigma square i, right? So this, this log likelihood or the negative log likelihood becomes the loss. And you know, uh, the input becomes the zi that is sampled from q. And you feed the zi, you get a corresponding, uh, a corresponding mean, and you assume a, a, a constant variance, and you plug it in, into uh, a, a Gaussian, multi, multivariate Gaussian uh, 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 likelihood objective, and here p will be you know one over two pi to the d by two, and you know the whole thing, right? So that's how the uh, that's how things work on the decoder side, where z i's we sample uh, are are sampled from from q i, but what are q i here? Q i are is the is the is the uh, basically the output of our encoder network. So this was the decoder network. The gradient with respect to uh, uh, theta was for the decoder part of the network. And the picture to have of the two working together is something like this. So let, let me do it. Z is latent, right? X is observed. Now the encoder takes us from X to Z, and the decoder takes us from Z to X, right? So in the variational autoencoder, we are using neural networks here and here. They are two different neural networks. This neural network has parameter phi and psi, right? And this is being used as a replacement for the E step. And over here, the decoder neural network has parameters theta, and this is being used kind of like the M step, right? But we are going to jointly optimize both these objectives rather than you know one at a time, and the, the 
uh, in order to optimize them with respect to, uh, and the way we uh, optimize them is by maximizing the elbow. So the elbow is what has phi, psi, and theta. And we want to calculate the gradient of this with respect to phi, psi, and theta separately and perform gradient ascent. And in order to perform the, uh, uh, in order to calculate the gradients, we saw this problem where the, um, the gradient with respect to theta was pretty easy because we could just swap the expectation and, and, um, and, and, and the gradient operator. So uh, for the decoder, this was easy. You know, we can just swap it. But for the encoder, where the expectation depended on phi and psi, we made use of the reparameterization trick. Okay. And after doing the reparameterization trick for both the gradients, we are still left with an expectation though. Right? We are still left with an expectation. We were able to swap it, right? but we are still left with an expectation. We did not eliminate the expectation. Right? And what is done in practice is those gradients are approximated using Monte Carlo estimates. Those expectations of the gradients are, are approximated with Monte Carlo expectations of those gradients. And the way uh, you, you, you think, of, um, think of it is, so we have the x's, right? And you have an encoder, which takes you down to z, right? And from z, you have something that takes you back to x, right? And in the encoder, we saw that the encoder takes, takes uh, 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 x as input, and in fact, it outputs two components, a mu component. So it outputs a mu component and the uh, sigma component as a diagonal matrix. Right? So the encoder takes x as input and outputs two sets of parameters. Now, these two sets of parameters are so if this is xi, these two sets of parameters together define qi, right? That's, that's, that's like the uh, uh, posterior. And from this, we are now going to sample a zi because you know, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the gradient has this expectation and for that we're gonna sample the zi's from these, uh, uh, from these parameters and we're gonna use the zi's as input for the decoder network. Right? So the encoder has parameter phi, the decoder has parameter theta, and we're gonna take these sampled zi's and feed it as input to the decoder to get, um, uh, to get the recovered or the reconstructed um, x's. And together with, with both these encoder and decoder uh, networks, we are able to construct the elbow Right, so the uh, elbow was, so the elbow was over here. Okay, so the elbow is over here, and this is p of x given z times p of z, right? And so this is the uh, decoder neural network, right? And everywhere the, where there's a qi, we have the encoder neural networks. Right? And the way we go about uh, 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 training uh, uh, training the variational autoencoder is to is to minimize maximize that loss and uh, we, we, uh, maximize the elbow, and we go about maximizing the elbow by calculating the gradients and taking gradient uh, uh, gradient ascent steps. This question. So uh, I would say this is, uh, so the question is, can we use any kind of neural network to do expectation maximization? I would say, you know, don't think of this as doing expectation maximization. We are, this is an alternative to expectation maximization. In expectation maximization is defined as the coordinate ascent approach, right? So what we are instead doing here is, we are just trying to fit a latent variable model where in um, the relation to, to EM is through this coordinate ascent versus gradient ascent interpretation.
So the question is, is coordinate ascent susceptible to saddle points or local optima? Uh, yes, they are. VAE is also susceptible to local optima, absolutely. They are not convex problems. All right, so that's, that's, uh, that's pretty much the variational autoencoder. Um, generally, the, the, uh, um, because we are assuming a constant variance over here, it generally works out that uh, the encoder loss works out to be just the squared error or the squared norm between the two networks, right? So here you, you use x hat minus x, right? If you work out the math, this part works out to be just the uh, squared error. And these two, the, the, uh, the encoder does not have a direct loss on its own, right? So there is no supervision for x's and, 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 sig, uh, and sigmas. Instead, the mu and sigma Will, will push these z values to one particular location and concentration, right? Because we are sampling z's from this distribution, right? And in case of, you, 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 can, you can think of the variational autoencoder to be exactly equal to the auto uh, to a, a simple autoencoder in the case where the covariances are zero, where we use the, 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 the mean itself as the z, Whereas in the variational autoencoder, we are outputting two sets of parameters, a mean, which will tell you approximately where z will be, and also a covariance, such that we, we sample, um, we, we are effectively adding some noise to the z before we take it through the decoder process. Right? And it's, this, it's, it's, um, it's motivated through this elbow maximization, uh, um, elbow maximization uh, kind of theory, but in practice, what you, what the way we actually implement this is to implement it as a simple autoencoder, except at the z layer, we add some noise in the form of the epsilons that we sample. Right? So, so that's that's variational autoencoders, and that uh, pretty much wraps up our study of unsupervised learning. And in the in the Friday lecture, we'll be kind of switching gears and and uh, looking at uh, at evaluation metrics and other general tips on on how to implement machine learning projects. And on Monday, we're going to just start the review of the full course, focusing on parts that are kind of important for the uh, final exam. Right? If there are any questions regarding this, you know, feel free to walk up and 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 I'll be happy to answer them.